Welcome to the live show. I'm Adam Quiney. I'm wearing a scarf today and I'm going to be pouring hot tea into this mug. And then what I will do to follow that up is I'm going to drink from this mug. This is the part of the show we call proofing where I'm sort of establishing trust with you. So you can see there's no tea currently in this mug. That's how you know that this is not a stunt where I had something other than tea in my mug beforehand. That's real tea. That's real tea being poured live. Seriously, this is the part of the show actually where I do stuff that makes me laugh, but no one else finds funny. And uh, and then I stop doing that and I talk about leadership stuff. So that's gonna happen too. We're just getting settled. That's the part of the show that, uh, you know, in theory, I guess I should begin alive by like grabbing you by the balls, really hitting you with some hard hitting kind of stuff that might um, keep you watching. And then we could go from there. But that's not how I do it, which is probably why uh, not many people watch this show. Good morning, Jess. Let's have a sip of tea while we get settled in. Mm. What do we have today? Earl Grey, creamy Earl Grey. That's vanilla mixed with Earl Grey. At this point, this just tastes like tea. It's tea flavored tea now. Not because it's not delicious tea, but you know how Orange Pico, um, America, we did. Well, this is kind of like the pre show. So this is where I get all the bad jokes that are like brewing in me over the week. Where I'm like, that's going to be funny to me and no one else. That's This is the part of the show where we do that. So we're, we're, we're just getting that handled, getting, it, getting the system going. It's kind of like um, kicking an engine up into high gear. Um, so you know how orange Pico tastes kind of just like orange, it tastes like black tea to me because that's what they normally serve. And, uh, so that's what this tea tastes like. Now I'm just trying to see if my, oh, there's my live. I can see me there. Okay, good. We're, we're working here. Oh, festivities says America. I've had a nice week. It, it's sort of like, um, it's funny because growing up, September was really felt like the start of the year because that's when school starts again and December is kind of like the break. And then, but you know, the year was really structured around the beginning of school in September. And so anytime I, um, anytime I come into fall, it feels like a new beginning kind of time, a, a point where it's like, all right, we can reestablish structure. I can choose back into my uh, routines and re-empower it and like kick things off. And so predictably, that's been the way life's felt a little bit. The last week uh, of summer, I felt quite sloppy. I was sleeping in, hitting snooze a little bit more. Generally, I don't like to snooze at all because it's very, um, uh, it's a slippery slope. You know, you snooze for five minutes. Why don't you snooze for another 10? And then why not another 10 after that? And then so on and so forth. So anyhow, all of that stuff has been there. And um, now that we're starting proper, I'm like, all right, feels like a good time to, to kick things off, to really get shit going. I see America. I see Jess. If you're one of these five people that currently show is watching, say hi. Put your name over there in the comments. Let us let us see you and know who you are and and celebrate you and tell you tell you how awesome you are. And I'm going to show you a couple books. I just got a recent book in the mail um, that I'm going to talk about before we kind of get into our leadership conversation. One of the things I really like in terms of books, I've got a few on my desk here, along with this magnifying glass to look at stuff through that my mom gave me as a gift. One of the things I really like are books as art. So, I mean, I love to read, but I also love um, books like, uh, hey, Micah, nice to see you, man. Uh, are you still doing cars? I saw you'd gone back to selling cars, I think, last time I had heard from you. Let me know if you're still doing that. It seems like a cool uh, thing to be working in. So I really love books that are just good content or interesting or good fiction, but I also love the concept of like book as art form. So like books that inside have a lot of beauty and I guess you would call some of this stuff like art books. So this one is called Knowledge is Beautiful by David McCandless. He has another one called The Visual Miscellaneum. And this book is just a series of infographics. You know, this, this shows a bunch of disappearing varieties of plants. Uh, what else do we have here? Here's this one shows a whole bunch uh, like breakdown of different religions and stuff. And um, so this describes Buddhism, enlightenment, the 10 fetters, the main schools, of all of that sort of stuff. So that's really cool. Here's another one called the book of circles. I've not even cracked this one. It just looks beautiful. I think that this is a whole bunch of infographics all in circular formats or uh, what's this? This is the dome of the cathedral of Sagrario, Sagrario, 
and Seville, Spain, or Seville. So two books I'm going to show you today are kind of a function of that. I just got the most recent one from this author called The Ultimate Atlas. This is the most boring looking book you could possibly publish, isn't it? This is the sort of book when I would go and do research in university on my degrees, they'd be like, all right, well, you got a research paper to write. So you got to go and get a bunch of dusty books out and bring a mask because you're going to pull them out and a bunch of dust is going to get in your face. You're going to cough. This is exactly the sort of book I'd be like, oh, frig, I got to look through this book. And um, it is kind of dry. So really the concept for this book, The Ultimate Atlas, is the author just created using a barcode, a whole bunch of different facts that allows you to visually see. So this is the number of libraries in any given country broken down. So China actually has the most libraries in the world, it looks like, then Russia, then India, then Ukraine, then the United States. And then it gets down to the point where we can't even see at the far end. So I ordered this book, not because of how this looked, but because of this other book I wanna share with you, which is the author's other piece, which I think is a brilliant book. And that's this one, The Handbook of Tyranny. Again, it's got that kind of boring looking cover to it, right? It looks a little dull, but this book is phenomenal. And what's phenomenal about it is, first of all, the, in the information is interesting. And what the author has done here is he's looked, he's compiled all of the ways that we as humans perpetuate tyranny on one another. All of the ways that we have learned to harm ourselves, to cause pain or harm or to lock up freedom, stuff like that. So here's an infographic showing all of the long range kind of missiles and how deeply they penetrate into the earth. Um, here's one showing all of the different types of walls and fences that we use. So we've got like an electrified fence, we've got barbed wire, we've got uh, in Russia, Mongolia, what do they use? So it's a really fascinating kind of book that simultaneously pre presents information that is just not there for me on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I don't think about anti-vehicle barriers and how those are present in the world around me. But as you start to read this, you start to say like, oh, wow, my city or this, this metropolitan city is set up a little bit to prevent someone driving a vehicle into harming people. That's how they've set that up. And they also have really, I'll show you like one more really fascinating graphic they've got here about Africa. So this shows Africa's current like how we've divided, we, colonialism has divided Africa up into countries. This is the division of Africa prior to any colonialism. So look how much more diverse the groups were over here, right? And then they all just got stuffed into, you know, however many countries exist in Africa. So fascinating book, highly recommend it. It's called The Handbook of Tyranny by Theo Dut. I don't know how you'd say that name. Dutinger? Dutinger. Dutinger. Herr Dutinger. Anyhow, really cool book. Highly recommend that. If you are like me, kind of interested in art books and interesting information you wouldn't find otherwise. And it's a lot more compelling to read through where there's visuals than, than just to like sit and read a book of dry facts. Micah, you quit your job. Congrats, man. Pursuing your sole purpose. I'm starting a spiritual based practice next week. And right now I'm working on building momentum and trying things out and refining how I want to do business from there. Beautiful. Congratulations. It takes a lot of courage to leave our job and it takes a lot of courage to return to a job. I really honor people on both sides of that equation. What happens in coaching often is people um, come into coaching often because of something they haven't resolved with their previous career. So I've had a number of clients like this where uh, they they have something about their current job or, or whatever they've been doing that festers. Like, ah, oh, your time is rendered so invaluable. No one cares about your time, blah, blah, blah. And so they say, fuck you to the job. And then they leave and they become a coach. And what happens is their money dwindles and they become more and more urgent about their need to, good morning, Evan, their need to get a client. And... Um, and what happens is there's no abundance in them. There's scarcity. There's fear about where the next paycheck's going to come from. How am I going to put food on my table? Oh my God, I have to make this work. Ah! And all of that energy then gets commuted across to the client. The coach can't really sit and allow the client the space to show up any way they do. The coach has urgency and attachment. They require the person that they're talking with to make a particular decision. Hire me. 
or and, and then from there, they do one of two things. They bulldoze the client into that, or they go all the other way to the other end of the extreme, making sure that they never push the client into anything so that they don't follow along with that impulse that exists inside of them. And both of these two paths make it really hard to stand for someone and to do so without any attachment. And so often when, um, when new coaches come into my practice and start working with me, one of the things that is like a, kind of like a, um, what's the right word here? Uh, I don't know what the right word is, but it's like a, a sharp moment where a breakthrough happens is often where they get to the point where they're like, I can't keep doing this without making clients and my neediness is getting in the way. And with support, we they get to the point where they're like, I need to go and get a job. And what's in their space is often this fear, like if I go and get a job, that means I'm giving up on my dreams. That means that I'm, I'm, I'm not committed to this thing. In truth, going and getting that job often for them is the measure of them really truly getting committed to, for the first time. Hey, Maria, welcome. Happy Friday. In being willing to go and work a job while they build this thing, they develop like abundance. They start to not have to worry about money and then they can kind of sit with all of this. They don't have to have anything to change because they know that they've got enough money. They know they have enough income. Now they can start to breathe. And so it's kind of funny where, um, I want to be clear, Mike, this is not about you. You just triggered this thought because of your courage and leaving your job. But often when people, when coaches have to kind of come to that humbling moment where they have to say like, hey, I am able to do something that earns me cash. I need to go back to that and empower that until I can move on. That's what then actually allows, that usually creates the abundance where then the clients start to come to them. And as long as they're holding their job at bay, fuck my job, I'm never going back there that energy actually keeps them from getting clients. The same thing happened for me when I, um, when I first discovered this profession, coaching and leadership, the sort of side part of it, uh, or maybe it's sibling is a better way to describe it. Um, I was in law school coming to the end. And at the end of law school, what we all knew we had to do was article, which is basically apprentice for a year. An article, uh, articling student or articled student meant you had, you could do everything a lawyer could do, but you had a lawyer checking to make sure you weren't flushing someone's legal personhood down the drain. That makes a lot of sense, right? Like, hey, we're not going to just turn you loose and have you fuck up someone's livelihood because as a lawyer, you really do hold their legal, you know, if a doctor holds someone's physical personhood, their physical life in their hands, a lawyer holds your legal life in your hands and you can get into a lot of trouble that way. So you're apprenticing effectively under a lawyer. And that required a lot of like humbling, a lot of sort of, hey, do you have a job? Going out and asking, getting rejected, being told there's no jobs, you know, schmoozing, all of the stuff that I was like, fuck that. I'm never going to do that. I'm going to be a coach. And there was a point where I was um, I was very committed to coaching. I was clear on that. And I was like, fuck law. That thing is dead to me. And so what I was doing was I was going, I knew I still felt like I had to get a job. I was going back to the work I'd done as a computer scientist before I'd even gone to law school. And of course, as you can imagine it, everyone I interviewed with was like, why are you here? Why are we interviewing you? You're in law school. Why are you coming back to this? And then of it was weird. That's why they thought it was weird. It was It was weird. I'd gone to school for this thing. And now I was kind of like flushing that down the drain or pushing it away. And it just left that energy in the space. And when there's energy in the space, we get curious. What's the deal with this energy in the space? There's some weirdness going on. And so for me, like I was just describing for the clients that I work with and for a lot of us, there was this humbling moment where I had to be like, this is weird. I'm in active resistance to something and it's not serving me. I think what there is for me to do is to like humble myself and to kind of come back to my cohort and say, Hey, I'm trying to find uh, I'm trying to find some work as a lawyer before I can take this thing off the ground. Do you know anyone? And what was amazing is um, when I came to that really difficult decision, it was really challenging for me to humble myself that way. Cause I'd kind of, I kind of left law and gone towards coaching the way people tend to leave Facebook which is like with a big long message. I've had it with this and I recognize there's no intellectual discourse here and you are all blah, 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 you know, that sort of bullshit, such fanfare, such arrogance. 
that's how I kind of left as uh, the law. And so I really had to humble myself. It was really tough for me. And, and um, I also had to come back to my friends and be like, yeah, I, I actually, I need to article. I, I can't, I can't dodge this and, and I'm sorry. And, and very quickly I, I started to share that difficult at first. I got some support from my coach at the time and, and started to work with that. And then almost like, you know, magically I shared with one friend who's like, oh, well, I have a, maybe an opportunity that might work for you. It's here in Victoria, which is very, very rare, very hard to find any job in Victoria in, in law. It's very saturated. He was like, it's here in Victoria. I, I, uh, I got it set up for me, but I've been really wanting to work in criminal law and I've just got an offer for that. So if you want, I can put you in touch with the guy. And I was like, that would be amazing. And my friend put me in touch with this guy named Darren, who turned out to be awesome and was just the best principal I could work with. He and I had very similar senses of humor. We got along like fire. And, um, and so things rapidly started to shift for me once I energetically got over myself. Once I got past this like resistance I had to law and to what, like, what I devoted three years of my life to at this point that's when things started to shift. So it takes a lot of courage for us to leave our work, but it also takes a lot of courage for us to choose into our work and do whatever it is that really serves us in the moment. Thanks for uh, drawing that out, Micah. I really appreciate you sharing. Spin kick moment. I love a good spin kick, Evan. Spin kick is one of my favorite uh, kicks. I often, <laughs> this is a random thing. Sometimes what I do is I go and I Google made up special moves. So like tornado boat spin kick, I'll Google to see if there's anything like that. There never is, but it's fun to see what does Google bring me back when I look up this karate, this karate move. Morning, Andrew. Maria, you write, I did that myself. I thought of it as my investor, changed the perspective. When I started my coaching practice, I initially felt like I was not committed to my A plan coaching, but in reality, it helped, or should I say, propelled me forward. See many clients who go through the tug of war. Yeah, such a great way to put it. Like. Um, we get caught in this never againness, and that that really gets in our way because it's not that what we need to do is necessarily go back to that same old job. It's that in terms of living a life where everything's possible, anywhere in your life where you have, well, definitely not fucking that thing, that's a place where you've shut down possibility. And anywhere where you've shut down possibility, that's gonna that creates an energetic hold on you. You have to kind of manage your life so that this thing never comes to be. And when you have clients that show up in your practice and you're coaching them, that you're going to naturally impose that same thing on them. They're going to show and be like, well, never again that thing. You're going to be like, yeah, good call. I'm with you because never again this thing in my life. And, and it just goes on. So that's the hard thing. It's not that what you have to do is take on a particular kind of job or field. It's that our resistance and unwillingness and insistence that never this is what gets in our way. It's the resistance that we're always looking at. Hey, notice there's some resistance here. That might be getting in your way. What special moves have you made, Evan? I, like I agree with your statement, but I'd like to know some of yours. I promise I'll credit you if I ever use them in a karate tournament or the kumite when I win that, that samurai sword. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's high time. We got some of these topics. Ten o'clock. Big thanks to who are our champions, hometown heroes, David Sherifat and Andrew. Thank you all for the um, the suggestions. These are, we got some awesome, awesome topics. I'm really excited to talk about these. We're gonna start with Andrews. I'm gonna read some of it. Andrew gave us a really nice description. Andrew, thanks for doing that. Um, so he says, I heard you talk about handling conflict from a place of leadership, and wanted to inquire further. And I recently had a situation in my Facebook community where an individual continually caused conflict with other members to the point that he was blocked by them. Then he would probably point out the fact that he was blocked by them in the public space. I called him out on it first time in hopes that his behavior would change. After the second occurrence, I kicked him out of the group as I honestly saw that continuing to moderate his behavior would be a waste of time and energy going forward. I offered to jump on a Zoom call with him to discuss our differences, but he didn't want any part of that and dished out a bunch of insults towards me. Oh boy. In all of that, I'm confident in the decision I made. I'm up for supporting people, but also recognizing there is a point where my boundaries, time, energy, and growth have to be respected. However, I see this as a place for growth, and I'm curious what else you have in terms of your thoughts on this, Adam. Really, really um, juicy topic. And I love where you're looking, Andrew, which is what we tend to do as humans is we make a decision 
And then there's no, often there is no right or wrong decision. We, we crave a right or a wrong decision because then it lets me off the hook. If there's a right decision, then I don't really have to take complete responsibility for my actions because the fact that it was right lets me offload the responsibility. Well, I just did what was right. Therefore, I don't have to feel bad. I don't have to feel whatever you feel. So as humans, we crave right, wrong. We crave something external to ourselves that lets us kind of be a little less in ownership of the choice we've made. And from there, when confronted with a situation like the one Andrew's presented here, what we tend to do is we make a decision and then we get righteous about it. What I mean by that is that we we get really like, we shut out our curiosity so that we don't have to be with the doubt about the decision. So we're just like, this is what I did. Fuck you, it was right. My fuck yous are sounding quite New York-y right now to my ear at least. Fuck, fuck you. I made the decision, it was right. This is what's happening. And then we internally justify our decision more and more to ourselves. And what that does is it, it, it helps you not be with cognitive dissonance. It helps you not be with your own doubt. And you don't have to really be with the challenge of standing behind a decision. You justify it, you justify it, you justify it. And hey, we all do this. And then you can just be like, well, I did it and I'm right. And then what that does is it, it comes, it, it reduces our openness. It allows us to sort of stand behind our decision a little more easily, but at the expense of being able to be open to other options and opportunities that we don't see. So my intention, Andrew, is to really acknowledge you for asking this question, for, for like what Andrew's modeling here for all of us is that challenging place where you have to make a decision, there's no right or wrong to it. And then he's really taking a look like, hey, I'm open to something else though. I'd love to see what else there is. And that's, that's part of leadership. It's that tension between simultaneously making a choice and standing behind our choice and at the same time being open to us not having, not being able to see everything. And maybe there's something else here so that next time I'm presented here, I can make an even more evolved decision. So um, let's see, I'm not coming for New Yorkers. I love New Yorkers. I think they're awesome. <laughs> are you in New York, Maria? No, because it's 7 p.m. where you are. So you must be, I'd put you somewhere, maybe France. If you are in France, oh boy. Carol, hey, Car Carol. Carol says emotional maturity is a real topic. Yes, it is. And the way I would word it, like um, the way I would hold what I'm talking about is our ability to be with discomfort without needing to resolve it. And particularly our own discomfort. So there's a discomfort that comes when you have to make a challenging decision and then stand behind it without having any external thing telling you you'd made the right decision. That's really tough. Oh, New York are based in the Netherlands. Oh, so cool. I want to go to the Netherlands. Anyhow, um, so that creates internal discomfort and it requires real uh, maybe resilience or like an expanded capacity to be with our own discomfort that would allow us to then sort of sit in that not having the right answer. Having the right answer really eliminates our discomfort. Oh, I don't have to feel uncomfortable. I made the right decision. Phew. There's great comfort in that. Um, <laughs> Mike, I want to know I made the right decision. And Carol, oh, French based in Cali. Bonjour. I speak French, not particularly well. I took French immersion all through school. So I, I'm fluent. But uh, it doesn't sound as beautiful as it probably does in your mouth. Okay, so now we can look at Andrew's kind of scenario that he's generously brought us. Um, so we have someone in a community, Facebook, et cetera, who is creating conflict. The first thing that we want to be present to is different communities allow for more or less uh, intimacy. What I mean is, if I'm face to face in a community with people, then I can be, there's more we can talk about. Whereas if I'm in a text based medium, which is Facebook or LinkedIn or you know Telegram or any of these groups, less of my humanity, less of my warmth and love and intimacy, less of who Adam is and, and how he cares about you is gonna come through in the signal. I'm just giving you 
cold, hard words, which means you're left to make an interpretation about what I feel behind the words I'm using. You don't get the signal. You don't get like, oh, Adam's saying this with a lot of love. You just see the words. Hey, I'm going to call you out. You are doing something wrong. Imagine I typed those words. Now I could say that here with you and be like, hey, I, I'm going to call you out. I really think that there's something for you to see. And you're going to feel, you're going to notice the softness in my eyes, maybe my heart, the sound of love in my voice. Whereas if I just type those words out, none of that's there. All you're going to see is I'm going to call you out, period. Whoa, full stop. Something, 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 something. So understanding the way our words are perceived, the way our communication is going to get interpreted based on the medium in which we're communicating is part of being a leader. Hey, how, without me doing anything and without them doing anything, how automatically is like, what am I speaking through? How is my speaking going to get distorted or received no matter what? And we want to start from that place so that we can kind of like, okay, got it. Getting a little more clear. And that way we can be more responsible and more impactful in how we communicate. If I want to offer someone a reflection in person, that's a lot easier. If I want to offer someone a reflection over text message, like sometimes my clients will text me, then I have to really, I, I want to go a little further. I want to make sure I include like a heart or I want to make sure that I provide more affirmation because I'm conscious of the impact of a particular medium. They're not going to get my heart in my words. Maria, we may take you up on that. I love that offer. Carol, I'd love it if you'd elaborate on what you're talking about. Some people can't handle intellectual friction. When I believe it's a great opportunity, I'll just shoot you up. Boom. Uh, Carol just writes that right there. Carol, would you elaborate a little bit on, you know, when you believe it's a great opportunity? And then I'll circle back because I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. So we have someone who's creating conflict for whatever reason and possibly intentionally, possibly not. And then when someone sets a boundary, this person kind of holds it out like a badge of honor. So my hunch, knowing very little about this person, would be that they don't know how to be any different. And, and I'm going to begin by assuming their heart's probably in the right place. Now, some people are just like there to troll. And if someone's there to troll, meaning like they're there to create upset and drama and, and, and hurt people, well, that's, that's that. But it's really easy for us to begin from that place. And from there, there's not much possibility. If someone's there to troll, what do you do? You boot them out of the community. I'm not going to work with someone like that. It calls me forward and them forward. If I begin, it doesn't mean I stay here forever, but I begin with that assumption. Hey, I'm going to assume this person's heart's in the right place and that this is getting created innocently rather than maliciously. It doesn't mean, therefore, I say, great, so their heart's in the right place, so I'm not going to do anything. We're still going to work with them. We're still going to check in and stuff like that. But it's where we begin our own stand for the conversation we're going to have. Second, my hunch is that when they show up this way and then people eventually are hurt by them and then block them, that causes heartbreak in them. Being blocked is embarrassing. Being blocked is like, fuck, fucked up. You might not consciously have that feeling, but when someone blocks you, that's like fundamentally they're kind of saying, I'm uninterested in anything further that you have to offer. I'm done with you. So it's a rejection of someone. And when that happens, one of the ways we deal with rejection is by kind of like taking it and making it our own. So it's like, ha, this person rejected me. That's not about me. They didn't fundamentally reject me. They're weak. So we, we take our heartbreak and rather than be with the feeling of heartbreak, which honestly, this person probably isn't even conscious of, they probably just aren't even aware that's what's going on for them. It probably occurs more to them like righteousness, which then is what they put into the, they righteously point out this other person's inability to be with the conversation, blah, 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 blah. So none of this is what I would intend to reflect, but all of this gives us a much more rich picture of what might be going on over there and it allows us access to more compassion with that other person because now we can start to be like okay let's imagine just for the sake of a place to begin a conversation with this person let's imagine that their heart's in the right place for some reason probably their blind spots they get into this kind of conflict and then how they are left is that people 
block them from their lives. And then this person's heartbroken and doesn't know how to do anything with their heartbreak. I'm not saying that's necessarily true. I'm offering and inviting all of us to begin from that place. From there, we can be like, okay, got it. Well, if, if this heartbreak is the function that then has people show up like this, at least I can hold a little more space and love for them, maybe, than if I'm just like, what an asshole, block them. That's really the, the biggest issue with a lot of our modern labels like asshole, narcissist, they're gaslighters, those sort of things preclude the possibility of anything else. As soon as we're like, this person's a narcissist, we're going to relate to everything they do through the lens of them being narcissistic. There's no opening for any shift or anything like that. And we're going to show up to that conversation and there's no room for anything different. We're going to show up and be like, how do I deal with this narcissist? Well, what do you do with a narcissist, right? You eliminate them from their life, your life. It's all over LinkedIn. See you, Maria. Thanks for hanging out. I'm just going to read what you said before you go. Most leaders don't comprehend that managing intellectual friction is crucial to create an ecosystem of brave collaboration, which is at the heart of leadership. I love your gift with words, Maria. If that is embraced in relationships of all kinds, it's transformational. It's all about communication. Yes, indeed. And connection and being with. So, um, so we've got a different way to relate to this person that might be a little more open-hearted and might have a little more space for them. It doesn't mean that we have to condone their actions. So just because we can open their, our heart and hold them with a degree of compassion and understanding does not mean that we then go, great, so keep doing what you're doing and try not to be such a shithead. What it means is that we are committed to relating to them a particular way while honoring the greater commitment in the space. So that's kind of what Andrew's talking about. Um, Andrew, I'm curious, you said I called him out on it the first time in hopes that his behavior would change. So I'm curious about that call out. And um, if you imagine someone heartbroken and probably bumping into their blind spots, it can be helpful for us to remember that our blind spots tend to exist in places where we have fear or judgment. And when you are feeling judgmental or fearful and someone does something that's effectively like, hey, I notice you're afraid or you're being judgmental right now. You already kind of know what you're going to do, right? Which is, no, I'm not. You are. Or no, no, I'm not. Mm, I think about it. No, definitely not. Not the case. So it's really hard because when we are at our most afraid, our most fearful, when our blind spots are loudest, it's also when we're least able to receive the reflection. So I'm really curious what your call out looked like, Andrew. Because often in groups, uh, okay, great. So Andrew says, I called them out in a private conversation. Great. So we'll go down that path. But I'll, I'll touch on this first, and then I want to read some of what you guys are writing. Often we think like, I'm going to be a powerful leader, and I'm going to stand for something in this group, and I'm going to call this individual out. I'm going to call out the behavior. We live in a bit of a call out culture. You know, Twitter is is a lot of that. You know, it, it cancel culture, call out culture. When you see bad behavior, call it out. That lacks a lot of compassion and it puts people on the defensive. And when people go on the defensive, they close further, which again, makes it harder and harder for them to allow their fear, judgment and blind spots to be seen by anyone, including themselves. And so Andrew, I got you did something different, but I just want to take this moment to acknowledge that when we call people out in a way we think is powerful, it actually just recreates the conditions that have things go around in a circle. So we, we want to avoid calling people out. That often doesn't work. Um, we want to connect with them and get curious. So now we'll go down that path. But first, um, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, oh, hey, Adam, nice to see you with us. Adam French, fellow Adam. Hello, Raf, good morning. Uh, Micah is saying, God, oh, thank you. God, your content is so good and helps bring back to consciousness what I feel I've learned, but practice almost somewhat innately. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. I really appreciate that acknowledgement. Um, it does the same for me, for what it's worth. Like in this co-created conversation we get to be in, it, it brings me back. It helps remind, remember me to this stuff as well. So Andrew got into a private conversation with this person. And I don't know what uh, the content of that conversation was, and you don't have to share it unless you'd like to, Andrew. But in order to make this topic a little bit 
succinct, I'll just talk about what I see I would do in a situation like this. And of course, the trap is anything that we speak to, we can create exceptions for. Like literally every time I've had my leadership developed, I'm like, ah, this is going on and blah, 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 blah. And then someone's like, well, take this on, Adam. Here's what I see for you. I'm like, I already did that. Or here's why that wouldn't work. And usually when we're really stuck in here's why that wouldn't work, there's some level of incompletion for us. Like I'm caught on some story that means that this thing isn't possible as opposed to the space where I can just practice like, well, let's give it a go. And what if that could work? And what is my belief that I'm operating over top of that tells me nothing is going to work? Because if I, as the leader, have a belief that nothing's going to work with this individual, it's going to be pretty damn hard for me to create any actual shift for that individual. I've already got a belief it's not going to be possible. Hard to make something happen when we're believing it's impossible. At best, what tends to happen is we end up just going through the motions, proving to ourselves and them that they're hopeless, and then being justified in it, and then we can fire their ass, shoot them out the airlock, and then we can get on and do the stuff that's meant to happen. So. Um, I'm going to read the rest of what Andrew wrote here, and then I'm just going to share what I would probably do. Um, so Andrew says, after the second occurrence, I kicked him out of the group as I honestly saw that continuing to moderate his behavior would be a waste of time and energy going forward. I did offer to jump on a Zoom call with him, discuss our differences, but he didn't want any part of that and dished out a bunch of insults towards me. So Andrew, probably the same thing, right? Like you've booted him out of the group. This dude is embarrassed. I would be willing to bet heartbroken probably feels like, fuck, again, this happened. And then that's all going to be really hard to be with. And so that gets covered over with a layer of righteousness and putting it back onto you. And then that shows up and manifests in the real world as him insulting you and calling you out and all that nonsense, which sadly just is going to recreate the thing, right? Because then you're just going to go, fuck off. And you're going to push this person away. And then, you know, that's how it goes. So one, one thing I find is often helpful in situations like this is to remind ourselves that this is the way this individual is creating every relationship in their life. Everywhere they go, they are creating this dynamic. And if we can really get that, and if we can also get that this person doesn't intend that, later on, people get resigned to this and then they, they learn to empower what they're resigned to. So as time goes on, they just start to be like, yeah, I just am tough and I'm not everyone's medicine, but I tell truth. And if people can't handle it, blah, blah, blah. So they learn to become empowered about the resignation they have about the way that they tend and seem to just keep creating relationships. But if we can hold like, hey, this probably isn't ultimately what they want to have happen in their life. Rarely do people want to get rejected over and over again. It's just if that seems to be the only thing you can create, well, of course, you're going to learn to empower it. If we can get that this isn't really what they want and this is what they're creating everywhere, we can really get like, holy crap, that's a tremendous amount of heartbreak. That would suck to be this person who just can't seem to get into relationship with people without fucking it up. And just imagine in those quiet moments, maybe at two in the morning, you know, really when they've woken up and they're just sitting there, you know, being with themselves, just imagine that feeling like, fuck, another place, you know, they don't get to hear that voice very much because that's a hard voice to listen to. So over time, they're going to push it further and further down and it becomes harder and harder to hear. And then they become more and more justified in the way things go and in creating this. But that voice never goes away forever. It's like a blade of grass growing up through concrete, whispering in our ears saying, hey, man, this sucks. I'm lonely. No one seems to love us. So being with that heartbreak, holding it almost for them, you know, this is like part of the sacred duty of leader and coach is to hold that heartbreak, the heartbreak they don't even realize they have. And to really get that and be like, wow, that would fucking suck. That would be a lonely, lonely life. Thanks, Carol. I'll, uh, I'd love to hear from you as, as you, uh, as you watch that replay. So thanks for being with us this morning or this evening, I suppose. So if we can get that and really understand, oh, this is the way they're creating it everywhere, that again, gives us access to more space. Now, what do we actually do for an individual like this? First of all, it doesn't matter how much we can understand the heartbreak and really feel into someone and get that this is innocent. If people are causing harm, then we set a boundary. This exists in my relationship. Like the way my wife was raised was with a lot of verbal abuse. And 
so that naturally kind of tended to be a little bit when she gets, we, we learn from our parents, right? So when she gets triggered, she can get very loud. And sometimes she used to shout a lot. And I, for the longest time, was like, my job is to love this person and just receive whatever she gives me. And I will be the strong rock for her. I'll be the lighthouse and she can crash her waves against me. But there's a point where it just becomes abusive. There's a point where um, I have to find my own boundary and I have to say, hey, I'm not a yes to being shouted at for an hour or whatever. I'm not a yes to being made fun of when I'm trying to support you. I'm not a yes to that. doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that you're wrong or bad or anything, but I have a boundary here. So I want you to know, honey, I love you and I'm here for you. But if you start to shout at me and insult me, then, then we're going to end the conversation. And when you're ready to come back and talk to me, I'm going to hear it and listen to you and all that. But I'm not going to just suffer abuse because that's not my job. It's not my job. And I don't have to suffer through that in my life. So that's kind of like, you know, that exists in our relationships. It's where we're drawing a boundary. Andrew, you're the leader of this group. There's a boundary, right? Hey, sorry, man. This is where the boundary is. For me, for this person, where I would want to really meet them is to one, give them the experience of feeling gotten. I would be willing to bet someone who goes into the world and ends up getting blocked by people often has an experience of not being heard. So that would be the first thing I would do in any conversation is rather than explain to them the, the impact of their actions, which is what we always want to do, we be powerful, I want to hit them with their actions. I want to really get how things have gone for them. I want to give them the experience of someone listening to them without an agenda, without a position, just really getting the way the world occurs for this person. What that's going to do is it's going to let the person start to breathe because they no longer have to hold on to their position in defense that it's going to be taken away. Instead, they've got me on their side. Just like, tell me how it is. What's this like? What, how's this going for you? What's your experience? What's the impact of this? Does this feel good? That allows us to really like, oh, okay. I don't have to righteously hold my point. So it allows them to start to open a bit. I'll, I'll speak to more of what I'm going to do. I just want to read what you guys have written here. Uh, Micah says, oh, my Lord, truth tellers bother me so much. <laughs> yeah, I know part of me does that too or did that in the past and in perhaps internal shame and judgment around it. Probably a resentment towards someone else's unconsciousness due to a feeling of I did the work and I'm so much younger than you. Why can't you do it? Uh huh. Truth telling is a really safe uh, place to be and it's totally fine. There's a real gift in telling the truth, but what truth tellers often self-proclaimed truth tellers, what they are unwilling and unable to do, like where their work lies, is meeting people where they're at. So me just telling you my truth, it's fine. I get to do whatever I want to do. But if I'm committed to leadership and to deepening relationships and that my truth being told to you has an impact that's positive, right? Like if you just want to tell your truth and, and it just creates a bunch of mess and you don't care about that, fine. That's your option. But if you're committed, like, I'm going to tell my truth, but in such a way that it makes a positive impact in the world. Well, what those people are stepping over is that we have to be able to gauge the level of truth we're offering to someone such that it meets them where they're at. Some people aren't yet ready to hear a truth. If someone's dog has just died and they love that dog, this is not the time to tell them like, hey, look, you cry all the time and you need to stop crying and start to activate your life. No, it's not the time to do that. And so often what's happening there is that the truth teller is, is unwilling and resistant to meeting the world where the world is at. They're very, there's like a selfishness in it, right? I am unwilling to meet the world anywhere. So that's often what's going on there when, when people just have that sort of self-justified, self-righteous kind of truth teller thing. Andrew, uh, you see, I definitely felt all of that in the situation, the hardship they must be facing. It was really a place where I was like, I spent a lot of time here. Do I want to continue this? And the answer was no. Definitely a place for me to look deeper. I'm thinking I'll reach out to this individual again from a different angle. Here's the other part I'll speak to with this individual is when we're asserting a boundary, there's kind of like two sides to it. The first is that we don't need someone to change at all. That's part, what a lot of people do with boundaries is once we've established a boundary, we then use it like a stick to hit people with. It's like, we're like, here's the boundary. And then people come up to them. We're like, whack, whack. We take our boundary up and whack them with it. That's not, that's not how a boundary works. What a boundary does is it, you put it here and you say, you don't have to change at all. 
I don't need you to be any different. I want you to know that I have a boundary and there's a consequence to stepping over it. But that does not mean you have to change who you are. That is different than the way most of us hold our boundary. The way most of us hold our boundary is I have a boundary and you must you must conform your actions to meet my boundary. No. The beauty of holding boundaries powerfully is it allows sovereignty on both sides. You get to do whatever you want. I am simply letting you know that I have a boundary around this and there is consequences to transgressing that boundary. If you step over it, I'm going to block you from this group. You don't have to do anything different and I don't need you to do anything different. And what that does is it puts the power back in the other person's hands. When we say I have a boundary and you need to make sure you stop stepping over it, we actually take power away from them. We are now controlling their actions with our purported boundary. Boundary is never something that forces someone else to do something different. It's basically a statement about a consequence of showing up a certain way. But in order for a consequence to really work or have meaning, people have to be able to choose into it or not. Right? So I have a, a boundary. If you start yelling at me, I'm going to walk away. You get to yell at me if you want. That doesn't. You're not wrong for choosing that. It's just that there's a consequence. I'm not telling you you're wrong for doing that. So when we set that boundary and then do so in such a way that honors their sovereignty, now they're at choice. And that changes the way people show up. If you take away their power, if you take away their choice, say, here's the boundary, you have to show up that way. Whenever someone takes away your power, what do you do? You act out, right? You clutch back for the fuck you. And you try to do the same thing. Well, I have a boundary, blah, blah, blah. And you try to hit them with your own boundary. So the first step, it would really be like, hey, I want you to know there's a boundary here. You get to choose, but here's the consequence. And then second, I would be an offer to help them see what's possible for them here if they would like. Not because they have to, not because I need them to be any different, not because there's something wrong with the way they're showing up, not because of any of that, simply because I'm willing to be in a conversation with them so they can see something else possible if they would choose. But I don't need them to be any different. Again, just like that boundary. I don't need you to change one bit. But if you don't, there's probably a consequence. And if you'd like to, I'm willing to help you. I don't have a horse in this race though. So that's that place. That's the being of coach and leader where we're unattached. And a lot of potent leadership is down this line, right? Look, person who's micro, look, direct report, Reggie, who's micromanaging everyone. I don't need you to be any different. However, there's a consequence. Currently, through all the micromanaging you're doing, you're behind on all your metrics. And it's okay if you want to just keep doing things that way. You can. The consequence, though, is if, you, if you're behind in your metrics four times in a row, we're going to have to have a conversation about who else to have on as leader. Because we just can't, it, our business doesn't work that way. We can't keep being behind on metrics and giving excuses. So if you'd like some support to shift that, I'm a yes to it. But I want you to know I'm not going to force you to do anything. This is entirely your own choice. And what we're doing here is we're empowering the individual while simultaneously giving them a clear consequence for staying the way they are. Giving a consequence in this way, it's really important that energetically we understand we're not forcing anything. So often the way we offer a consequence is like it's meant to force someone to change. That can't be the way you set a boundary that you set a consequence. And so this is the power that comes from this. This really puts power back in people's hands and that fundamentally changes things. Because what it does is it takes away their ability, it kind of disarms their ability to blame you for them getting kicked out of the group. You haven't made them get kicked out of the group. You've made it really clear. They can, they're welcome to stay in the group. There's a, there's a code of conduct. And so that then kind of forces them to confront, maybe for the first time ever, like, oh, this is my choice. I'm the one making this happen. Now, they may not do that. They may not agree with it. They may not follow along with it. That doesn't really matter. What you're doing is you're being with them in such a way that it empowers them and empowers their leadership in the moment because now they're back at choice. And anytime someone's put back at choice in their own life, as opposed to at the effect of someone else, that empowers them. That has them step more into their own leadership. So that's that's what I would do, Andrew. I'm curious if any of that sort of, is there anything there that that tweaks something new for you? Or like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Anything, anything about that that sort of 
lands false or like, wow, there's no way that would have worked or, you know, what, what shows up from that? I'd love to hear. Um, I just want to see, uh, Micah, you wrote something that I wanted to read here. Uh, a while back when we were talking about jobs, Micah just wrote, I've been on both sides of the job thing before, both leaving and going back. Both take balls, figurative balls, either man balls or lady balls. But supplementing my practice, I'm building with side jobs and they've been pouring in. I felt I needed to have faith and jump. And then when I did, everything would work out. And it did. Sorry, the comment is a little late. You don't have to worry at all. Uh, you had to meet up with a guy to sell tires. <laughs> He's selling tires. That always seems to me like something that happens in the back of a van. Hey, you want some tires? Micah says, when you don't at least let yourself sit with dissonance, at least some of the time, you're blocking the expansion of your nervous system. So, so true. So right. And it's so easy to get stuck in being right, especially because sometimes there is a right decision. Yeah, so true. Back of a Jeep. There you go. Okay, I know a guy with some uh, with some tires. Uh, Jess says, wow, that is such a powerful way to define boundaries. That helps immensely as someone who's had a hard time establishing boundaries because it goes against my people pleasing defaults. I so get it, Jess. And what I want to share over here is me too. That stuff around boundaries is, I I'm clear on that now because I've had to bumble through it because the way I've been about boundaries is I can be with everything. So go ahead and put anything you want on me. I don't know if it was people pleasing. For me, it was like being a good leader, being a good man, being a good husband, being a good coach, being a good friend. And it's really been um, challenging to learn to put a foot down, especially because the thing about boundaries is there's no right place. There's just the place you choose. So ironically, sometimes when I put my foot down, I do so, but then it's like someone can say, well, you're, they, they challenge it, right? They're like, well, wh why the fuck do you get to have a boundary there? And th the answer is because I'm choosing to have a boundary there. There's no right answer. And so I have to be willing to stand firm on it, not because I'm right, not because it's justified, but simply because that is what I've decided. That is my sovereignty. You get to choose wherever your boundary is. You can say, I have a boundary. If you look at me the wrong way, I, I kick you out of my life. There'll be consequences for both you and other people for having a boundary like that. Uh, Andrew, I think this shows up in similar ways throughout my life. When I find that a person becomes a burden, I'll often boot them out of my life. Yeah, flush them out the airlock. So I see this as an opportunity to be with that discomfort and be willing to go a step further. I stand by the decision that the individual shouldn't be in the community, but it doesn't mean I can't give them support or a conversation if they're willing. Yeah, and Andrew, it also doesn't mean you have to. That's the other side of this is, Sometimes um, as we deepen our leadership and we can be with more and more in life, it becomes very easy to get into the state of mind that because I can be with everything, I should be with everything. Because I could support anyone, I should support everyone. And that's not necessarily healthy. Sometimes it's like, hey, this I'm choosing no. You know, peace be with you. I'm choosing no. Um, I want... Can I push this up to full high definition? Because I think that'd be cooler. I'm going to try and do that and see if it looks any better. Uh, Jess says, I also like that the consequence is separate from their choice. Totally, right? Like, I will walk away so it helps separate as actions I can take to get needs met. Yeah, and I think that's such a gift for people when we're really clear about it. Makes such a tremendous impact in leadership. And that's often where people get caught. They're like, well, I don't really have a choice because I'm going to get fired, so I have to do this. That's a choice. Getting like that you still have a choice there where we abrogate our choice from ourselves is often because we're unwilling to face a particular consequence. Okay, let's, Andrew, great topic. Thank you so much for bringing that. Really appreciate you. Uh, airlock spin kick move. Google it. I'm telling you. Sherfat says, what do you do when you start creating art, but it's boring to do it alone and you can't seem to find someone with the same aim or goal? I have noticed I get bored just by making videos alone, but I enjoy it more when I'm having it with someone, but I just haven't been able to find a fit. Do I quit making art or do I force myself to do it alone? Mm. So the first thing I'd point to there is like, notice the binary nature that Sherifat's given herself. I can quit making art or I can force myself to do it alone. And that's the only two possibilities that are really available. I would challenge you, Sheriff Hat, like I, if, if this was a coaching conversation, if I was coaching you on this, I would be like, well, what have you done to try to enroll people in partnering with you? 
Like, what is the process by which you've gone to seek out people to partner with you? And more often than not, when people say, uh, I haven't been able to find a fit, they've tried maybe four, maybe five, or they've invited like three people. And then they're like, it's not possible. I can't do it. And what I would challenge you is a couple of things. One, I would challenge you to stand in the possibility that you can find someone that's a fit if you are committed to that. So that's the first place. Right now, you've kind of, I'm asserting, removed that possibility. And where you're hanging out is I can either do art by myself or I can just stop making art. Those are my two possibilities. I would say if you're really committed to finding someone to partner with, you can find someone. So that's a starting point that you are willing to stand in this possibility rather than take what I would assert is the easier way out and say it's not possible. So therefore, these are my two choices. Then if you're willing to hold that belief that it's possible to create art with someone and to find the right person, then the second step would be commit to it. Meaning you say, okay, it's possible. I just haven't created it yet. And two, now what am I going to do no matter what to make that a reality? How many people do I have to ask? Where do I have to look that I haven't looked already? What am I going to have to confront internally? What might I have to be willing to face to actually create this and to not let thinking about all of those things I just said stop you from taking the action that's going to move you towards that possibility. So we have to be willing to take action towards this. We have to, hey, I'm going to be committed to this possibility. Absent first seeing something as possible and standing in it, and then second, being committed to it, nothing will change. Nothing will happen. And then from there, I'd be curious where you get stopped. And I would assert like my guess is you get a couple of no's or you do a couple of videos with people and then you just like, you sort of get like, oh, it's never gonna happen for me. And then the possibility bubble bursts. And then you go back to, I guess I either have to choose between this or this. What if it would take a hundred conversations before you found the right person, but then you found the perfect person to create art with? Would you be willing to go and have a hundred conversations so that you could have that result? Does it matter enough to you? Is this something you actually want? So this is what we're doing here is we're, we're kind of, this is often the unsexier part of coaching where it's a little more rigor and a little less distinction and conversation about and like creating new awareness. It's like, oh, there's not a lot of awareness to have here. There's sort of like, are you committed to that possibility? Do you want that? And are you willing to do whatever it takes to create that? There's 8 billion, 7 billion, I think 7 billion is what we're at. 7 billion people on this planet. There is someone for you. There is someone that would be amazing in those videos that you would have the best time. You just have to be willing to do what it takes to create that. The same is true when people go, Adam, <laughs> when I talk to new coaches, they're like, Adam, it's not like it is for you. Where I live, no one loves coaching. Everyone's against coaching. And I'm like, dude, I live on an island <laughs> with a population of about 300,000 people. And when I started coaching, most of my friends thought I was a loony. Like no one <laughs> believed in this. You're right. There's probably more acceptance of coaching where you live than where I live. That story just has a shutdown possibility. And then we operate inside of, well, it's hard where I am. So we go out and create an experience of creating clients that's hard because we've decided that's how it's going to be. So Sheriff Ad, it's possible, it's available, you can make it happen, provided you are standing in that possibility and you commit to it. Um, what is the, I had another one that was mine. Oh yeah, how to expand time. Let's talk about that. Let's fill our tea up. So, um, I'm just sort of trying to pull the pieces together here because, um, oh, Mike asked just any idea what kind of art they're trying to uh, create. I'm curious. Uh, I think Sheriff Ad is trying to do videos like these, like she wants to do lives, um, short videos, that sort of stuff. So I believe that's what she's up to, uh, Micah. But uh, you know, this would apply for anything, right? The I get you're just curious because of that, but this isn't really about doing videos. This is about our ability to hold something as possible. And um, 
it's amazing how much what we believe dictates what actually occurs. If I believe something's impossible, it doesn't matter how much action I take, I'm gonna end up proving my belief right. So if I believe it's impossible for me to uh, make money, I don't know, selling stuff, but I'm like, I don't believe it's possible, but I'll do it anyhow and we'll see. I'm gonna trudge through it. And my energy about it being impossible is gonna like actually create the very belief that I'm holding. So our beliefs are that powerful. They really determine stuff. Um, and Micah, any way we could connect? I might be interested in a conversation with her. That's why I was asking. Absolutely. Let's see if I can just tag her. Well, let me tag her here. Nope. Uh, but I bet I can reply. Um, oh, now it's going to do my, that. It's annoying. Okay. I don't want to do that here. I'll, I'll connect to you, Micah. I love that you asked that though. That's so awesome. And uh, I'm pretty certain that she would really enjoy. See if I can just no, it's not going to let me do that. Annoying. I'll, I'll put you guys in touch. I think that'd be really cool. Really fun. And it is more fun to do this stuff together. That's why I'm here with you guys. You know, I, I don't have someone else in the same room as me, but like even this way, we get to be in a connection, a connected conversation. All right, Andrew, you say, uh, my extent of expanding time in a sense right now has been with the 80-20 principle, and I'll say prioritization. The book Conversations with God was a good eye-opener in this into the dynamic that past, present, and future are all the same. Here's where people find time very dilated and tight is when they're in what we could call like their survival mechanism, when they're under the influence or acting out as their shadow. So we'll talk a little bit about this before I get to kind of the main thing. When I'm coming from my shadow, I'm either overemphasizing something that is innately me, or I'm underemphasizing something that is innately me. So if I am at brilliance and I'm around a bunch of people that I'm afraid might think I'm dumb, my tendency might be to go out of my way to prove my brilliance. I use big words. Maybe I'll be a little condescending in my tone. Maybe I'll adopt a fake British accent, whatever it happens to be. And if I'm around a bunch of people where I feel justified or not, I create the idea that they might be intimidated by my intellect or make fun of me for it, then I might dumb myself down. So I might go out of my way to reserve the opinions I have about foreign trade. I might not bring topics like that, or if someone brings that topic up, I might just sort of like, oh yeah, it's tough and move on. So in either of those situations, I'm, I'm expressing something into the world that is um, out of alignment with what would be truest for me to express. I'm either overemphasizing or underemphasizing. So that's kind of how our shadow goes. And ultimately, in both of those cases, what I'm doing is I'm in a degree of resistance to my being. I'm resisting being what I am innately. Instead, I'm projecting something. I'm putting on artifice. I'm performing something. We could draw on this for literally any quality of being that you guys want. And if you want me to talk a little bit about a particular one, just shoot it in the comments there and, and we'll do a bit of a side channel. But like any quality of being has flavors of this where we put something forward. And so, for example, if I was still with that brilliance and I was working on a, a project, rather than trust the brilliance I am as being just naturally there, I might get halfway and then just quit or I might like over prepare. We got any over preparers in the conversation today? Like, you know, the people that are like, ah, okay, I've done this much, but now I have to, now I'm going to throw it out and I'm going to redo the whole thing. And then I'm going to edit it 58 times. And then I'm going to rehearse it 27 times. That's exhausting. The reason that's exhausting is because you're in active resistance to the innate brilliance that's there. You're not just trusting, like there was a part of you long ago that was like, this is done and good, but you couldn't trust it. And so you then got into overperforming. All of that artifice is what drains us. All of that artifice is what has us feel like time is scarce and slim and running out and there's not enough. That's what has us feel drained. It's what has us feel burnt out, exhausted, tired, frustrated. It's what makes time feel so, so tiny. And like what leaves us running around and scurrying, trying to fit everything in. When we trust, when we express ourselves as we are innately, without needing to put performance on top. And to be clear, this isn't just something you get for free. You have to do the hard work to distinguish where am I performing? Where am I in my shadow? Where am I working to do this? Ah, Jess, my over-preparer. 
There's a pattern I've been working through this. Beautiful. Thanks for, for honoring that, for owning that. And hello. So when we can release that, we can simply start to show up as ourselves. And when we can do that, there's no resistance between, th there's nothing internally that we're resisting. We're just being with whatever shows up in our life. And in that way, time becomes very expansive. It doesn't mean that you can suddenly do 48 hours worth of work in 24 hours. What it means is that you start to be able to let go of the fears that would have you feel like you need to do 48 hours of work in 24 hours. Like, if you think about it, what the real question there is not how do I do 48 hours worth of work in 24 hours? That is an inherently silly question. The question, the more powerful place to come from would be like, what has me trying to do 48 hours worth of work in 24 hours? Like, what is it that has me choosing into that game? Where is that coming from? Because if I just told you, if we took it out of the context of something that's like time, and I said, take this mug, now take this four liters of milk, and I want you to pour all four liters of this milk into this mug without spilling any and without the mug overflowing, you'd be like, screw you, that's dumb, that's impossible. Why would I do that? What we can't see though is that we do that with time. And then we just, we don't question what has us creating that. We instead get to the point where it's like, ah, and we run around like crazy and just insist that we need to do it. And we don't slow down to ask these questions because we don't have time to look at these questions. Oh my God. So there's a real freedom when we start to be like, hey, hang on. What has me trying to fit all of this into this tiny little bit of space? And that's where time really starts to expand. So it's not by like learning how to manage your time better. It's about learning why we're scurrying so much in the first place and getting really curious about that. Uh, Jess just replying to Andrew says, oh man, Conversations with God was such an eye opener on so many levels. Yeah, it's a really great book. I love that book. And I highly recommend it to anyone. I'll just pop it into the, uh, can I put it here? Let's see if this works. Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. Boom. I think Jess just wrote speed up to slow down. Where are you there? But I think it's the other way around, isn't it? Slow down to speed up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just followed up. Boom, nope, have that backwards, slow down to speed up. The funny thing about those pithy statements is that they're simultaneously so true, but in their pithiness, they become, um, they become like jargon. They become like, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Like pablum, like just irrelevant almost. Like, yeah, it's a throwaway line. Oh yeah, slow down to speed up. If you're the smartest person in the room, get into a new room. S slowing down to speed up is hard because a lot of people don't understand what has them going so quick in the first place. So simply trying to address the behavior on the surface yeah, you'll slow down, but you haven't addressed really what any of that is about. So it's going to find a new way to reassert itself inside of the new actions you're taking. I'll give you a funny example of this. I used to, I used to play a video game called Hearthstone and um, I'm a very passionate guy. So when I get into a video game, I don't just want to play the video game. I want to be the best at it. And so I listened to this podcast by these two guys who uh, were very brilliant and talked about strategy in this game. Uh, and they were both lawyers, which was cool too. I, it, there was a period where I reached out to them to see if I could coach them. I wanted to kind of get into coaching high level video game play, e-athletes, e-sports, but that, that fell apart very quickly. But they would do this podcast and they were both, they had great degrees of brilliance, very, very, very smart people. And one of them, I remember, was doing, his friend had not shown up for this, this particular podcast, and he was, he was um, sharing about this new set that was coming out. And as he was doing so, he was talking really, really quick. And he said, at one point, he said, you know, my editor tells him you got to do slower, uh, shorter episodes. So I'm really working to try to get all the way through this. And the result was he, he had like an hour and a half, two hours, I think it was actually four hours worth of content. He did it in two hours, but he achieved that by talking twice as quick. So that's not really changing anything, right? Like, yeah, the episode is slower, is, is shorter, 
but there's no underlying shift in that. And so that's an example where this, this, what's really going on is this guy's brilliant. And I would assert my hunch would be that there's a part of him, like a lot of people with brilliance, it's like, I need to get all of what I can understand across. I can't give people a bit or a, a bite or like a piece and let them connect the dots. I got to do it all for them. And otherwise they're not going to get it. And from that place, his choices are kind of like, well, spend four hours, or since my editor said do two hours, I give them all of that just faster, more compressed. And not surprisingly, you can imagine that's gonna have even less of the impact. That's not better. That's gonna be even harder to have that come into your head. And what people are probably gonna end up doing is just listening to it at half speed. <laughs> you just have the same four hour podcast. So there's an example where, <laughs> Micah, there's an example where, uh, addressing the behavior on the surface without distinguishing what's really at play underneath it does not make the difference we hope it will. And this is what most leadership approaches are engaged in, is like addressing the behavior on the surface. This is what much most call out culture actually ends up doing. It calls out the behavior without any curiosity about what's going on underneath the surface, without any inquiry into the actual human being at play and so at best it has people then like ah, i'm being called out they tr they change their behavior on the surface but whatever is underneath that was causing that problematic behavior in the first place never gets addressed in fact it just gets pushed further down because shame is attached to the call out which then further decreases your ability to bring it out and look at it with the light of day it's actually quite re-traumatizing or re-wounding that th this sort of like culture we live in I'm not saying we can't, we shouldn't call out bad behavior. I'm just saying there's a consequence to the, um, the superficiality of the layer at which we're operating when we just call people out through stuff like tweets and, and stuff like that. Micah, uh, right now, I literally am laughing out loud. It's Instagram motivational lingo. Yes, not what she particularly said, just pithy statements in general, albeit some of them are useful, but rarely do they really stick. Jess says, yeah, I think the pithy statements are really useful in the context of our own individual work, i.e. to help remember things we've learned in order to integrate. Yeah, that's great, Jess. They're kind of like a sticky reminding you of a thing as opposed to the sticky being the thing. Often when we share sound bites, it's missing all that personalized underlying work we've done that gives the statement such impactful meaning for us. And then Micah just responding to Jess. And maybe the shift is looking at how we communicate the personalized work in less words. Maybe body language, tone of voice, maybe even music in the background. Not sure, just ideas. All right. Um, we have two more topics we'll, we'll hit on, I think. Maybe another one. We'll see. Uh, so Sherifat asks also, how do you stay away from phone addiction? And really, we could talk about addiction as a whole here. Um, phone addiction is... Let's talk about addiction as a whole first. So often addiction is held like this physiological thing where some people are predisposed to alcoholism. Their genes just grab a hold of alcohol I get a bit more, I guess. They're more prone to it, blah, blah, blah. Um, the way I hold addiction in general is it's a coping strategy to deal with some internal missing. There's something missing internally and whatever it is we grab a hold of that allows us to cope with that internal missing, then that is like a lock and a key, right? If you have a underlying um, degree of self-loathing and it's unpleasant to be with that self-loathing, so there's like a missing of like ability to love yourself, to relate to yourself as beautiful and whole exactly as you are. And then smoking pot allows you to feel good and numb that out. Well, then that's like, oh, what a good fit. The trouble is that anything that we use in that addictive kind of way, it's um, there's two problems with it. One, it's not actually what we require. It's a facsimile. It's sort of like a, I guess you could call it ersatz. That's a good way. Like not actually the thing you need. It looks like it and it temporarily creates a reprieve for this hole, but it doesn't actually fill the hole. The second problem is that the nature of anything that we're using like this, which is really like a painkiller, is that painkillers have half-lives and they have uh, tolerance that happens. So we're never filling the hole, we're using this thing to numb the pain of that hole. 
just like any amount of painkiller over time, you need to take more and more of the same painkiller to numb the same degree of pain. Your whole, your pain doesn't have to grow, but you have to increase more and more painkiller to keep yourself from feeling this. So from that starting point, we can start to build a lot out. We can look at things like anxiety as an addiction to thinking. Now, I want to be clear, this is not, I'm not suggesting this is like scientifically what most of the world talks about when they talk about addiction. I'm just offering this as an approach, a way for us to look at this stuff. And then we can kind of do some work within this, this, this approach. So we could look at anxiety again, like panic attacks, anxiety as being addicted to thinking because our thinking in some way feels it, it resolves the pain of some missing inside of us. We can look at drugs. We can look at drinking. We can look at a lot of these things the same way. They allow us to feel a particular way or they fill up a particular hole for us. And then over time, we need more and more. Likewise, sex, illicit affairs, money, drugs, uh, adrenaline rushes, uh, getting into abusive relationships. These are all forms of addiction. So that is the beginning place. And like, likewise, then I would start to say like our phones and our addiction to them, so to speak, right? We're using that term loosely. It means that there's something there that we're craving, but rather than the deeper, harder work of going and being with that pain and feeling, feeling it such that we can then be like, what do I really need in this moment? Instead, we jump to the painkiller because the painkiller is easier. I've had friends with um, anxiety, like challenges with anxiety. Sorry, that's not a craziness. That's like mental, mental anxiety. And what is dangerous down that path is that you can, you can get prescribed medication that shuts off your thinking. It really like kind of puts your brain into a sleepy mode. It makes you not care about stuff. That's incredibly compelling because rather than have to be with all of that thinking that's going on in your head, you just flip it off of the switch. That's way faster than peeling back the layers of anxiety to get all the way back to the missing, the hole, the fear, the whatever that's there inside of you, and then really slowly filling that up. So that's the nature of like what makes our addiction so compelling is they're like, like a painkiller deals with the thing immediately, right? Oh my God, my leg's broken. My femur is killing me. Give me that. Oh, that's so much better. I don't even need to go to the hospital. Fuck the hospital. I don't want to go and sit in surgery, waste my time. I got shit to do over here. Just give me more of that coding and I'm fine. I'm good. Trust me. And then we build our life on top of that. Oh, it's hard for me to walk though. So I, I think I'm just going to attach crutches to me. So that's why addiction is so compelling. That's why we reach for that phone or we reach for that joint or that bottle or whatever it happens to be. It's because it gives us an immediate solution. An immediate solution is always going to be sexier, more compelling than the harder work of peeling back this stuff. It allows you to just stop feeling it as opposed to have to be with all of it. So from there to, uh, did my thing stall out here? Am I actually live? It looks like I am. Can you guys write something? Let me know if I'm actually here. Because it looks like Facebook went a little wobbly, and I'm I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, but I'm going to keep going. It's recording this anyhow, so it doesn't matter. So then, to Sherifat's question, oh, still live. Thanks, Jess. Um, to Sherifat's question, how do you stay away from phone addiction? Well, it's a series of things. The first is it can be helpful for us to set some kind of boundary. If, um, like. When I, for me, it used to, <laughs> hey, James, nice to see you, man. I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, when I used to, I used to smoke pot all the time. That was like my main, first of all, I can create addiction out of anything as most of us can. And this is why actually, as we remove one vice, a new one pops up. So, but anyhow, with pot, there came this point where I had to just stop it outright. And, you know, there's friends that I like to get stoned with and we'd hang out and be like, oh man, never. And, and really I was like, you know, I, it's not that I can never smoke pot. It's that right now I have to take it off the table completely so that I can do the hard work of being confronted with whatever there's here for me to confront. And until I've done that, I can't really get stoned because getting stoned keeps me from being with that. And so I have to, 
take this. Oh, you're going to hear that's why I was asking that enough. Stop that. There we go. And so I had to take it off the table and I had to let go of the idea that I was ever going to come back to it. And what that then did is it forced me to reconcile with, you know, like kind of this God shaped hole that I had this um, loneliness that I felt in my relationship, the safety of getting stoned and masturbating rather than creating a thriving sex life with my wife, like all of these things, I didn't really have to face as long as I was smoking pot. Because I would smoke pot and then get super creative and be fascinated by dry toast. And then I never had to confront my boredom. I never had to be with any of that stuff. So the best way usually to, to deal with our addictions is to kind of like, you know, if, if the phone is your thing, take off the stuff that you keep going back to, right? If, if it's like the game that you love playing, there's a point where you might have to say, hey, I'm going to take that off the table for now so that I can do the harder work of going inwards. And it's really not, it's not easy. The important part though, is that we don't just want to abstain. So that's what most of us do is we abstain and then we white knuckle through it rather than now I'm forced to confront this pain and this stuff. Can I feel it? Can I feel whatever is there that's driving me to reach for this? I've been, oh, James says, um, thanks for sharing this, James. James says, I smoked pot every day for almost 25 years and then took it off the table almost two years ago so I could be with me and pay attention to me. Yeah. Anything you noticed show, like that you'd be willing to share, James, that has like shown up for you as a result of that? Um, for me, I really like boredom was a big one. And I would say my ability to be fascinated by more and more of life, like my ability to hold more and more of life with reverence has come from having to reconcile my boredom. Oh, these moments when I check out from life, it's not that life is boring. It's that there's something I'm unwilling to feel in this moment. There's something here that I'm unwilling to get curious about. And so boredom is the retreat. And then, and then I've got an addiction to manage the boredom, right? So it's like two hops. And so I have to go back here, sit with the boredom and then get curious about that to come back to the real thing that's there for me to, to connect. Another one I, I've I, like, I started drinking later in life. I started smoking pot quite young, about 13, which, you know, that's fairly young age. So that was like an early coping thing. The later in life you pick up this stuff, like I started smoking cigars I don't know, I think it was like 19. And by smoking cigars, I mean like one every two years. I could take or leave those. I'll enjoy one now and then just because it feels kind of badass to smoke a cigar. I think I even, this guy sat at my desk for like two years. There'll be some time when he gets smoked. But anyhow, you know, the later in life we pick something up, usually the easier it is for us to just set it back down. So pot, very close. Alcohol later on, but still it was there. And so... Lately, I've been not drinking and I've noticed, hey, April, nice to see you. I've noticed there's times when I'll be driving home or going to the grocery store and I'm like, man, I could really go for like a good cocktail. Like I want a Negroni right now. I want to taste that bitter, bitter Campari in my mouth. And I start getting curious, like, hey, what, what has me wanting that right now? What's driving up that desire for a drink? What's really there? And, you know, sometimes it's like, man, it tastes good. I like the taste. But often if I'm willing to, to keep going deeper, I notice stuff, stuff like, oh, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling lonely or I'm feeling messy and sloppy. And it's easier to keep feeling sloppy. It's easier to keep drinking and fuck cleaning my, my office up or stuff like that than just to really confront that and then do something about it. So that's how we work with it. We set it down and then we, we go inwards with it. A great book about this is um, Mary O'Malley, The Gift of Our Compulsions. The Gift of Our Compulsions by Mary O'Malley. And I got to post it here. And then can I put it in Facebook? It doesn't read only to Facebook. Come on now. There we go. I'll put it in there. Uh, the Gift of Our Compulsions by Mary O'Malley. Not the best written book. Like I didn't find her writing particularly good, but like the underlying concept that she teaches in that is really beautiful. And it's kind of this idea, you know, when we're feeling compelled, there's something underneath, there's somewhere deeper to go. Andrew, you say, I've definitely brought some addictions to conclusion. Social media is one that I find myself going back to while thinking I'm independent or able to be in solitude. So easy to jump on social media and create connection over being in my own solitude. Yeah, well said. It is indeed. There, I, I like, it's interesting. I've noticed 
I'm editing a lot. And so I'm not writing as much, not creating as much content, which means when we log into Facebook, there's not a lot of like those little red badges where people are like, they don't say, no, sometimes they say this, but often they're not really saying this, but like my mind is like, oh, look at all these people that think you're cool, Adam. I like your post. I shared your post. This is great. This really hit home. That feels really good. And not having that, it's a little bit, I lose that hit, you know, that shot to my arm. The other thing I'll share about this is money for a long time was like a, a bit of gave me that that hit. I would make a bunch of money, I'd get hired and then be like, yeah, we're flush. And it felt amazing. And as we've uh, created the breakthroughs to be really consistent with money, getting hired, getting a big amount of money isn't that sexy anymore. It's just sort of like, well, there's more money flowing in, but it doesn't really change who we be. So our life is not any different by virtue of money coming in or leaving, which means I don't feel the terror or anything when a bunch of money, like I have to make a big payment for our income tax uh, today. I don't feel the dread that I used to. I feel quite calm about it. But likewise, I don't feel the, the like, fuck yeah, when a big amount of money flows in. That's gone too. So in releasing the drama, life becomes quite consistent in, in regards to these sort of things. It doesn't mean there's not excitement in life. It just means, huh, money's lost its sex. And you kind of miss that sometimes. You know, We kind of like some drama, some highs and lows. So it's interesting letting go of our addictions. We lose those lows, which is really nice. But some of the, the peaks can kind of be like, oh, I miss that. I miss when money was more dramatic. Uh, James saying, um, letting go of the pot, I live with the facts, I'm present with life and see the facts rather than what the story is or the paranoia of what, uh, that's so brilliantly put, James, thanks for sharing that. Also was able not to take things personally and separate who I am from what people condemned me to be. I am the A, B is what others may say of me and C is the space in between. Yeah, really beautifully put. Micah says, great reality check and a great practice for me to take on when I find myself worrying about the way of the world or finances. Mm -hmm. Okay, last one we're going to talk about today. Finishing about 15. Um, David asks, how do you work with people around creating new beliefs and the embodiment of those? So remember when I was talking about Sherifat's question, do I quit doing art or do I do it alone? And I was inviting her to create the possibility that she could have something different than those two choices. So working with someone's belief is inherently a part of transformation. The reason you don't have the stuff that you feel is impossible to have is because you feel it's impossible to have. That's a little circular, so let me give you an example. If you believe it's impossible to make a lot of money working 20 hours a week, or let's say you believe it's either impossible or requires great luck, then you, I can pretty much guarantee, are not gonna be making great money working 20 hours a week. And you're not going to look to see how you could create that for yourself. And you're not going to, you're going to set it, you're going to disbelieve, you're going to set aside any evidence filtered out for people that are doing that, or you're going to attribute what they're doing to great luck. So it's self-containing our beliefs dictate what's possible for us. And if we believe something's impossible, it's not coming into our life. It all starts and ends here. No one's going to come and prove to you otherwise, because your beliefs are self-filtering. So anytime as a leader or a coach, we want to support a team or people or our organization to create something that is not inside of our existing paradigm, we have to start by shifting our belief. We have to create a new belief, a belief that allows for the possibility of what we currently don't allow for. So maybe I'm working with a law firm and they're like, yeah, you know, what's possible, what the market can allow for. Market is usually one of the ways we justify our beliefs. The market can allow for us to raise our rates by 10%. So our choices, Adam, are we could either get a 10% increase or we could double our profits, but that would require doubling the amount we work. So those are our two choices. And I might be like, well, do you want to double the amount you make? Like if you could do that and it wouldn't require one of those two options, would you want that? Totally. Okay, great. Would you like to work around that so that we can create that possibility rather than have it be impossible. Yes. Great. So from there, what do we have to do? We have to begin with a couple things. First, we have to, hold on, let me give you the altitude before I dive into the map. Um, 
So we have to help them create that new belief so they can see a possibility for themselves where they are actually able to double the amount they work and work half as much. Currently, that is impossible. They are just looking here. This is the bubble that they can currently have stuff in, and there's no room for that. So if we want to support them to create a truly transformational result, they're going to need to create a new belief. To do that, the starting point first is to get a sense of our existing belief and its limitations and what it provides us. And the tricky part there is that our beliefs don't occur to us like beliefs. They occur to us like the way the world is. That's why, like, you can, yeah, I'm just going to read what Sherifat wrote against. This is such a great example. I've noticed I get bored by making videos alone, but I enjoy it more when I am having it with someone, but I just haven't been able to find a fit. Do I quit making art or do I force myself to do it alone? There's not a thing there like, how do I shift my belief about this so that I could have a different possibility? What there is, is these are the choices. So you can find, you can see, you can sort of like sniff out your beliefs by beginning to ask yourself, like, where am I sort of, I can have this or I can have that. That's the, that's what a belief typically does. It gives you a set of choices and that's the choices that are available as opposed to like, it's all on the table. It's all abundant. Um, sip of tea. There's something else that I really want to say here that feels important. So let me just find it again. Notice the abundance of time in this moment while I'm just sitting with it. I'm not sure what it is. It's going to come to me as I'm speaking. So the first step is for people to start to notice the bounds. Oh, this is what I was going to say. There is no best belief. There is no right belief to have. You don't have a set of limiting beliefs and then a set of powerful, amazing beliefs. You just have beliefs. And the bad news is, is every belief is inherently limiting. Every single belief you have, there is no such thing as a belief that doesn't limit scope to some way because a belief imposes some particular lens on the abundance of the world. So that's not bad. That just means we wanna get out of this notion of, oh, that's a limiting belief and that's a good belief. And we just wanna to start to hold all beliefs as simply beliefs. So we can look at them a little more agnostically, a little more neutrally. So initially what we want to do with this law firm or with a client or whatever is support them to just see the belief, kind of like helping a fish see the water they swim in until a fish can start to distinguish the ocean that they're swimming in from something else, from the land out there. We can't really do much. Evan, exactly. It's self-limiting. That's exactly what I'm saying. You and I are in agreement, you slippery scoundrel. So we have to help that fish see the water. We have to help this set of lawyers. We have to help, et cetera, et cetera. We have to help these people able to see the beliefs they have. So the way we do that is we begin by asking questions like, okay, well, tell me what currently feels like it is possible. Tell me what currently feels like it's impossible. That gives us a bit of like black, white, right? You can do this, you can't do that. What are the reasons why this feels impossible? It might be like, um, well, uh, the market says this. Okay, great. What else? Well, clients, blah, 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 blah. And what we're doing is we're elaborating on that particular belief. So rather than just, it's just the way it is. Now we're starting to get curious. Why is that just the way it is? Tell us more about the, the scope of this belief. Go deeper into it. People often want to stop their inquiry at this point because they haven't really done much. So they'll, they'll say things like, well, it's just the way it is. And I'll be like, great, tell me more about that. And they're like, I don't know. Do you have any ideas, Adam? No, dummy. <laughs> this is your belief. Do your work. This is your work to do. The extent to which you're willing to get curious and do the hard in work of like intellectually excavating this stuff and really answering this for yourself is the extent to which you can start to break free of this belief. So are you a yes to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So why? And they're going to give you all the reasons. And often these reasons don't occur like beliefs, they occur like absolute concrete truth. Our clients, no one in this field charges more than this. Okay, great, we'll write that down. It's impossible, blah, blah, blah. Great, we'll write that down. Clients won't do this, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, great, we'll write that down. So that's all the beliefs. And then the next thing we wanna look at is all of the actions they take to compensate for these beliefs. So given that client, you have a belief, 
that clients won't pay this much, or we could even call the truth. How, what do you do then as a result of that? Well, we adjust our rates accordingly. Oh no, is my sound cutting in and out? Jess, that's very annoying if that's the case. Please, someone else let me know if that's, if that's happening. So we've got all these beliefs. Now we look at all of the actions. Uh, yes, Sheriff Ad, <laughs> I, I have, I've answered both of your questions. Now we have all these actions. What do you do by virtue of the fact you believe the market can't bear this? Oh, well, we only charge that rate. Okay, great. What else? Uh, we, we, when we do charge more, we go out of our way to explain it to our client and we're very apologetic about it. Okay, great. What else? So you start to get all of the actions they take from their beliefs. And then lastly, we want to look at what is like the world that ends up getting created by virtue of those actions. So like what do those actions ensure is impossible? If both of these things are the way the world is, that you believe this, this is true, and these are the actions, where does that leave you? Well, it means that we can never really feel good about charging a full rate, like the rate we believe we're worth. Either we don't, we undercharge, or we uh, we sort of placate. We, we go out of our way to apologize to a client, and then we feel bad, and the client feels like bad, like we've done something wrong. Okay, great. What else is impossible? So what this gives them is it helps them really see the totality of this belief. They can see all of the stories about it. They can see all the actions they take as a result of those stories, and they can see what those actions then make true. And what will naturally happen as people do this is they'll see that it starts to wrap back in on itself. If you believe that you can only charge this amount and clients will complain if not, and if therefore, anytime you charge above that amount, you apologize profusely to your clients, then that's going to make it really hard for your clients to feel good about you charging any amount above a certain point because you're all apologetic. And when people are really apologetic about something, we're like, well, they obviously did something wrong. And as a result, that's going to reestablish, it's going to prove further that belief that clients don't want to pay above a certain point, blah, 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 blah. That gives them the, the whole picture of their beliefs. And then what we can do from there is have them go and start to bankrupt it. So what that means is that people go and now notice this happening everywhere in their life. It's like once you've established water and what fish do as a result of water, and then what that makes impossible, you then give the fish, you say, all right, go and notice water for the next two weeks. Notice what that allows you. What does that give you? What does that stop? Where does that really serve you? Where do you automatically just assume that water's there rather than really doing work with it? So that's having people start to notice the nature of their belief. And as they do this more and more, they're gonna start to come more and more present to the limitations of that belief. They'll start to be like, fuck, here I am doing it again. And I can see the clients getting frustrated. This sucks. People have to collide with this sucks in order for a belief to change because they have to start to bankrupt the belief. And the reason that's an essential part of the process is because until you've bankrupted it, you don't realize that you're actually getting some payoff from it. We hang out in our existing beliefs because it serves us in some way. So for someone to have a belief that they're ugly and unattractive, for example, part of the payoff of that is they never have to really um, confront the fact that someone might not like their personality they can always be like, well, they're rejecting me because I'm ugly and unattractive. And if they start to like, be like, I'm not going to buy into that belief anymore, there's going to be a point where they're going to start to put themselves out there and stop buying into the story that they're ugly and unattractive, and someone may still reject them. And that's now going to hit much closer to their core. Because now they're no longer being rejected for the superficial reason that they've created, that's safe. They're now being rejected for a deeper reason. So it requires real courage to confront our beliefs colliding with the suck. That's great, Evan. Thanks for uh, represencing that. There's more to this, but I don't want to go too much further into it because we're getting a little heady and it's a big thing. So we'll talk about this next week, but this is largely like so much of the work is here in this part where we're distinguishing the belief. We're really getting clear on the totality, its benefits, its consequences, and then having people go out and just be like, fuck, Adam, I keep seeing this, fuck. And usually when I'm working with teams or people or leaders and they're, they're really doing this deep kind of work, this part of the process is pretty, it's um, not depressing, that's the wrong word, but it's like heavy. It's a bit of a slog. 
because now they're going out and rather than sort of being ignorant of the cost of what they're up to, they can see it everywhere. And they're like, ah, in fact, I feel worse at them. Before I was doing this, but I wasn't aware that it was costing them anything. It was way better. Now you got me going out and I'm still doing the same things. I can't seem to do anything different, but I'm just noticing how much crap it's creating. That's good. That's the client starting to approach the breakdown, which is an essential part of any transformational work. And from there, we can start to create the new belief. So we'll talk about that next week. Okay. Uh, I just want to check the stuff we had, our topics, create art from conflict, working with boredom, phone addiction, how to shift your beliefs, how to expand time. We did it all. We nailed it, guys. Um, if any of you are looking for a video game to play, I am super enjoying a game called Nowhere Profit right now. I'll just put this right here, and then I'll tell you what it is, and then we'll wind down. It's available on computers and on Switch and maybe on some other systems. I don't know. And the style of game that Nowhere Profit is, is a deck builder, meaning as you go through the game, you add more and more cards to your deck. And it's a tactical combat game. So you have a little grid where you put your units and then you attack the enemy and they've got little units. And the art direction in this game is phenomenal. The music's really cool and the setting is really awesome. And it's all turn-based. What that means is you can make take an action and then you can go and make lunch and you can come back and nothing's changed. So you don't have, it doesn't require you to sit there really absorbed. You can pick it up, put it down. It's very easy to, to, to get into and then walk away from. I think it's phenomenal. So if you're looking for a game, if you're a gamer like me and you're like, man, I, I wonder what, what are the cool kids playing these days? I don't know about that, but I know that this guy is playing Nowhere Profit and he recommends it. So you've got that recommendation. Okay. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Great to see you. Shout outs to Evan, Andrew, um, especially thank you to David, Sherifat and Andrew for your uh, comments and feedbacks and big thanks to everyone just for being here and, uh, and commenting and, and playing along. It's a fun way to end our week. Don't you guys think that? Like I always look to Friday with such delight because I'm like, oh, 10 o'clock, we're going to be in a conversation. It's going to be cool. I'm going to like learn something new by virtue of what you guys put in the space. So big, big heartfelt thanks to everyone for taking part and being here with me. Love you guys. Have a good weekend. See you soon.